Welcome to APCM, the Emergency Medicine Center. A 57-year-old female presented to ER with complaints of slurring of speech and gait disturbances since two days. On initial 10-second assessment, patient conscious oriented obeying commands, airway patent, no pooling of secretions, breathing, respiratory rate is 14 per minute, saturation 98% in room air, circulation BP 130 bar 90 mm mercury, pulse rate 74 per minute or all peripheral pulses equally felt, disability GCS 15 by 15, bilateral pupil equally reacting to light, exposure temperature 98.6 degree Fahrenheit, GRBS is 120 milligram per deciliter. Ample history, patient who is a known case of hypothyroidism on regular medications and CA endometrium uh, post hysterectomy and staging laparotomy one week back now presented with complaints of slurring of speech and gait disturbances since two days. Episodes are more during daytime, nights were symptomless. There was no history of any deviation of angle of mouth and tongue or tosses or hemiparesis or headache, vertigo, fever or vomiting. Bystanders give history of small stepping gait and decreased hand swinging movements during walking and mask like facies since two days. On examination, so how did the bystander say the patient had mask like facies? Expressionless. Yeah, expressionless. That is the thing. When, when we study about mass like facies, what we have to understand is uh, when we talk to bystander, we have to ask whether they are uh, responding to our questions or the talk of the subject, whether their facial expressions are there or not. On examination, patient, patient conscious oriented obeying commands, no pallor, ectosinosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. CNS examination, patient is awake, alert, obeying commands. Patient has no dysarthria or dysphasia at present, no facial asymmetry, bilateral pupil equal reacting to light, eye movements are normal, no nystagmus, no sensory loss, all reflexes are preserved, power 5 by 5 in all four limbs and no pronated drift, no cogwheel rigidity. Cerebellar test, uh, dysdiadecocaniasia is normal, finger to nose normal, Romberg's negative, straight line test negative, heel knee test negative, gait with small stepping uh, small stepping gait with decreased arm swings. Other systems were within normal limits. Uh, drug history, the patient recently had a surgery for CA and The rhombus was normal, right? Yes. Patient was not having any swaying or no. anything. Uh, patient recently had a surgery for CA endometrium and patient was on TAP perinome 10 mg TID since last 5 days. Hmm. Uh, we, we had taken a VBG. Uh, the potassium was 3.3, sodium 136, calcium 1.2. Uh, the lab values were uh, sodium 138.8, potassium 3.7, calcium 9.43, phosphate is 3.5 and magnesium 2.3. We took a MRI brain stroke, pro stroke protocol to rule out any acute CVA but it was normal. So diagnosis, uh, extra primary side effect of the perinome, hmm. tap perinome, oral perinome. Okay, so when a patient presents, this patient presents to the emergency department, the problem that we are going to face is time. This patient presents in two days. Since two days, we have adequate time for evaluation of the patient. There is no emergency because even if it is a CVA, it is a evolved CVA. There is no thrombolysis or thrombectomy to be planned for this patient. So we have more time to examine the patient, make a generalized conclusion or send even other blood test or evaluation for other differential diagnosis. But any patient who presents with similar history, when we say extrapyramidal symptoms, we have basically <coughs> movement disorders, right? Uh, in, involuntary or uncontrolled muscular movements is what the patient is having. So, uh, patient may present with, for example, this patient was having difficulty in walking, short shuffling gait with uh, uh, decreased arm movements is being present. Certain patients will have back muscle spasms making the patient fall forward. Certain patients will have facial uh, dissymmetries, drooping of uh, angle of mouth, uh, smacking movements, many things. But when a patient presents within like acute presentation, that is within a day presentation, our main aim should be to rule out CVA because if at all is it's a pyramidal tract feature or if it is a cerebellar feature, we should not miss it in consideration of a condition that is known life threatening. 
Now EPS is not a non-life threatening condition. There is only one condition in EPS which is life threatening. We will come to that. But other than that EPS generally has symptomatic derangements for patients. Patient will be uncomfortable but is non-life threatening. Since this is two days old, we have adequate time for evaluation. Otherwise, it's always a stroke protocol or a neurological imaging just to make sure it's not CVA. Now, when you say this patient is presenting with 24, means 48 hours, right? Two days. Two days. Yeah. Ideal test should have been CT because adequate time for uh, CT evolution of um, CVA is been there. So, you take a CT, CT is clean, you can say that patient does not have CVA. Especially since we have got a drug history which shows perinome, the patient was taking perinome for three times a day. So, we have a uh, EPS inducing drug, patient has EPS like features, not all features. This patient has very varied features, it is not a very classical features at all. But since we have perinome as a culprit there, we could have done a CT and finished it off and said it is a perinome induced. Fine. So, let us come. So, what is extrapyramidal symptoms or motion disorders? Uh, when there is a dopamine receptor antagonist. Speak up. Well, uh, when, when we use any drugs which are the D2 receptor antagonist, uh, we will get this. Yeah, increased dopamine uh, content in the brain, isn't it? Yeah. So, D2 receptor antagonist is what is causing the features. What are the typical drugs that will cause this? Uh, D2 antagonist. Any like typical drugs we can mention about? Uh, antiemetics. Antiemetics like? Metoclopramide. Metoclopramide. Mm, pro Any pro psychiatric medications are yeah. there which will cause this thing? SSRIs. SSRIs can cause uh, EPS yes. features will be there in SSRIs. But more commonly, first generation. First generation antipsychotics are very notorious to cause EPS features. In first generation antipsychotics, which is the most commonly associated? Haloperidol. So, haloperidol is something that patient can, if patient is on, will develop EPS features. Very prominently. So, we should think about when a patient has EPS features or if you are getting a history like this in which patient does not have any power deficits, patient's powers are normal, reflexes are normal, the symptoms have been going on for some days which is progressively increasing in nature and you cannot localize the lesion in the brain. The features of this patient is not at all localizable, right? You cannot pinpoint this area is having a lesion, it is generalized. In such a condition, a proper drug history has to be taken and first degree, first generation antipsychotics or even second generation antipsychotics. So, yeah, second generation, uh, we have cutiapine and uh, respiridone and all. We should ask because even though second generation, that is atypical antipsychotics are unlikely to cause, there are many case reports that shows second generation to have. SSRIs should be asked, antiemetics should be asked and even lithium can cause extrapyramidal symptoms. So, lithium history should be. So, basically a, a psychiatric drug medication list we should ask the bystanders. Very clearly we should ask them. Now, uh, drug history will become very important in this patient. After drug history, what is the other thing that you will ask? What are the other features? So, you, this patient, the bystander told the patient is having decreased mobility and the movement uh, of the patient is not correct. Mm -hmm. What are the other classical features of EPS? We have dystonia yeah. and dystonia and acasthesia. So, what is dystonia? Muscle spasm. Uncontrollable muscle spasms. Uncontrolled muscle spasm, spasm can happen in anywhere in the body, right? Upper limbs, lower limbs or in the facial muscles. So, you have what are the mazes can be there, a prodding of eyes can be there, darting out of tongue, rolling of tongues, smacking movements, all these things are dystonic features. So usually when dystonia is there, if it is aggravated significantly, patient will complain of pain painful, uncontrollable movements. So, patient will be telling, I can't control this, I keep doing this. So, uh, it is kind of like tics, but tics will have a very chronic 
history okay so dystonia will be the upper limbs uh, dystonia can mimic like chorea and arthritis it can mimic like that so patient presents with chronic dystonia features without any um, other extrapyramidal features can look like chorea and arthritis okay then akathesia is there what is akathesia restlessness hmm restlessness restlessness so that's why we asked in romberg's how was the patient basically patient will have very difficulty to stay straight or st stay in a position without moving patient will always have a urge to keep moving so normally patient will have a rocking movement up and down rocking movement or patient's uh, foot will keep twitching or moving or swinging so basically restlessness will be there this is uncontrollable patient will not be able to hold it even if he want doesn't want to do this even if he holds that area it will keep repetitive action and all the actions are repetitive in nature it's not a new action that happens it's all rhythmic and repetitive actions will be there so you observe the patient for some time you will understand that this is not something that is involuntary voluntary happening it's involuntary and it's always the same repetitive motions okay so you got the symptoms you ask these symptoms you get the history you get a offending drug how will you proceed what are the differential diagnosis you should consider only cerebellar we told in acute phase we should always suspect cva cerebellar features we should suspect and do what other dds you can think about tetanus tetanus so uh, tetanus classical tetanus is very drastic very like uh, but say unique presentation is tetanus patients usually will not worsen uh, slowly patient will worsen within like hours and uh, but patients will have grimaces patients facial features tetanus facial features are very much in like of eps systemic features will not they we have the uh, arch like positioning toning muscular contractures which is generalized this thing won't be generalized as such uh, it will be affected to one group of one area or one segment group of muscles only uh, eps will be usually getting affected that is there what else what are non toxicity say basically any condition that causes increased muscle spasms you can put as a dd for uh, eps the good thing is usually those things are generalized in presentation this is localized in presentation what else now what other oh why is we told so when we told dystonia is not life threatening it's highly unlikely what is one condition in which dystonia can become life threatening in nature when affecting the respiratory muscle yes not respiratory muscles it can affect larynx so laryngeal dystonia can cause involuntary movements of vocal cord and pharyngeal dystonia can cause vocal cord muscle spasm causing airway occlusion and that can lead to respiratory arrest and failure so that is one condition in which dystonia has to be rapidly treated otherwise it's life threatening for the patient now there is something known as dystonia storm dystonia storm is a very peculiar condition it's a very rare condition very rare condition but it's a very peculiar condition in which patient will have hyperpyrexia hypertension tachypnea and dystonia generalized dystonia not segmental or individual dystonia generalized body dystonia so generalized body dystonia will look like patient is having tonic posturing of body or increased uh, rigidity of the body is something that we will see in dystonic storm so hyperpyrexia not hyperpyrexia increased temperature yes pyrexia not hyperpyrexia pyrexia tachypnea hypertension generalized dystonia that is increased rigidity of body any other conditions can that can mimic the current neuroleptic malignant syndrome neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome both of which we expect to see in a psychiatric patient due to either change of medicines or change of dosage serotonin syndrome uh, just requires change in ssri dosage itself can precipitate uh, um, serotonin syndrome neuroleptic malignant syndrome requires multiple drug interactions but 
that is why drug history becomes very important in these kind of patients. So, when a patient presents with dystonic storm, there is a high probability we have to think about neuroleptic malignant syndrome and sertonin. Usually, we will think NMS and sertonin syndrome rather than dystonic storm and all three are life threatening in nature. Okay. Well, how will you treat the patient? Injection Phenergan. Speak now. Injection Phenergan 25 mg IV. We have given for this patient injection Phenergan 25 mg IV. Okay. So, you can give uh, Phenergan for treatment, which will relieve dystonic features. So, dystonia relief is basically done with Phenergan as such. You give Phenergan, how much time it will take for symptoms to get relieved? 5 Fine. to 10 minutes. You give injection Phenergan, within 5 to 10 minutes, patient will have dystonia, means disappearance of dystonia. So, it is very easy to identify patients in dystonia with other conditions. You give one Phenergan dose, if patient improves in 10 to 15 minutes, patient is having dystonia, EPS. If not, you have to suspect some other conditions. And since Phenergan is a drug, we can very easily give, very readily available very easily to diagnose such patients. For example, we have the drug history, we have this history for two days, we are given a Phenergan, patient improves, we could have told this is not CVA. But that is only true when we have the patient after like window periods, not during window periods, we should always suspect CVA as such. Okay. So, injection Phenergan is one thing. But uh, there are other conditions also, like dystonia is one thing, right? But a patient can have muscular spasms, isn't it? So, painful muscular spasms. So, pain relief should be given along with this. So, even if you give Phenergan and uh, the muscle spasm subsides, patient may have pain related to the ongoing muscle spasm. So, pain relief, adequate pain relief should be given. Now, think of a condition in which such a patient presents to you with maybe one week history one week history, went to some hospital, didn't get proper treatment, that there are no improvements, so they are coming. So, patient is having generalized or segmental upper limb movements, tonic movements of upper limb is there, repetitive movements are there, very painful, lot of muscle groups are involved. What other complication will you suspect? Renal failure. Due to? Um, Rhabdomyolysis. You should suspect muscle injury. It is more likely due to myoglobinuria causing renal uh, injury uh, rather than rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis requires a lot of muscle uh, injury, means direct muscle death to release that much myoglobin. But repetitive uh, actions of muscles will cause uh, myoglobin, increased myoglobin, which can cause renal failure. So, rhabdomyolysis is something you need to keep in your mind. So, hydrate the patient well, right? Treatment for rhabdomyolysis is basically hydration. Hydration, forced diuresis is something you should, if chronic history is there, you should send for creatine levels just to make sure patient does not have renal failure. Acute presentation that is within 24 48 hours and there is no requirement for that unless patient is having generalized features. This is not generalized. So, we didn't send myoglobin. That is fine. So, rhabdomyolysis is something we can think about. Certain patients will have a beta blocker uh, is being given for uh, akinesia and uh, dystonia uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, um, certain patients with uh, facial uh, this thing, dystonia, usually um, chronic, tardy dystonia, they will have to be given botulism injections, but that and all does not come under emergency medicines per view, so we do not go into that. So, extraparameter syndrome is much easy if we get a very proper extraparameter syndrome history with, from the patient. It is very easy to diagnose because you will understand it is an involuntary segmental repetitive motion. But otherwise, in CV and all, it is not a repetitive motion. Patient will have lesions like deficits will be there. Here, patient will not have any deficit, only motions will be there. And um, second thing is, you can give an injection Phenergan, readily available, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes maximum, patient will completely improve. So, very easy to get diagnosed, very easy to manage also, if history is typical. History is atypical, then we have to be extremely careful, 
especially very acute presentations because it can mimic a CVA. Okay, anything else we need to cover in this? Okay, okay. Second thing, it can also mimic like if it is affecting only single area of the face, it can mimic focal seizures. Okay, 